Wow, that, that's the best introduction in the history of the world there. So thank you, Pastor Matthew. <laughs> I, he cracks me up so much. I love him so much. He just spoke at our church, and the people love him there. So we can you just thank the Lord for Pastor Matthew, Pastor Caroline, the family. They uh, Listen, good pastors are hard to find, good pastors, good shepherds. And he's been with you 24 years. He was 12, he was 12 years old when he came here. Isn't that amazing? All right, so I, this is a series. So I, had, I was praying today, I had three words for the church tonight. Three words came to me over and over again. I'm driving around, walking around L.A. today, okay? Three words, and I don't know where they're coming from. It's really bizarre, but you okay to receive this, all right? Okay, LeBron, Kawhi, and Paul. Just keeps coming to me over and over again, right? I don't know. I don't, is that the Lord? I don't know. Oh, you just two. You'll take two of them. Okay, well, all right. Well, I'll let you and the Lord work that out, all right? Anyway, it's good to be. If you're not a basketball fan, forgive me, all right? But he's a basketball fan. That's for the pastor. All right, open up your Bible to Luke chapter 14. And we're going to be in Luke chapter 16. We're going to be in both places. Luke chapter 14 and Luke chapter 15 and 16. Those three chapters detail the last conversation, the last real long conversation that Jesus had with his disciples. And do you know what the, the big topic of the conversation was? And it, it, it could have lasted hours. But the central topic of the, all three chapters, when you read John 14, John 15, and John 16, is the Holy Spirit. So can I just share with you one of my favorite topics tonight? Surrounded by the Holy Spirit. Surrounded, living a life that's literally immersed, consumed, saturated, and infatuated with the Holy Spirit. And I, 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 want you to, I want you to just open up your heart tonight. Maybe you have never, maybe you've never welcomed the Holy Spirit into your life. And so tonight I'm going to share a story with you in just a moment that I believe at the end of this message you're going to, you're going to want, you're going to have a holy desire, a holy longing to welcome the Holy Spirit into your life. Can we just do that right now? Can we just ask the Holy Spirit to come into this moment with us? Father in heaven, these words that we're about to read are sacred. They are holy. They were written by you and given to us. These words are meant to be weighty. They are meant to change our lives. They are meant to penetrate the darkest parts of our heart. They're not going to leave us the same tonight. When we read these words, we give you permission, Holy Spirit, to send your spirit into every life, everyone watching online. People listening to this message years from now are going to hear these sacred scriptures and their lives will be changed but tonight in this place right now in this moment we ask and give you permission to come holy spirit now i want you to just say those three words with me tonight just say them out loud with me i promise you this is something that's going to make sense to you but just say come holy spirit we welcome you holy spirit in the name of the father son and the holy spirit everybody said really loud Amen. Amen. Literally on the first page of your Bible, go to where your grandmother signed it, table of contents, and Genesis chapter 1. Let me show you something, okay? Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. On the first page of your Bible, we find the Holy Spirit at work. Let me read this to you real quickly. It says, now the earth was formless and empty. Formless and empty. And darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God... The Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters. Wow. First page of the Bible, we see the activity of the Holy Spirit and at work in a formless, dark, shapeless body of water and life. And nothing was making sense. Listen, tonight, I don't know why you're here tonight. Maybe you stumbled in, maybe you were invited, maybe you're here every Thursday night. But tonight, there are in a lot of hearts and a lot of lives in this room, there are places that are dark and formless and shapeless and empty and the holy spirit has come to fill those places tonight this is why this message is important for you tonight to lean in and listen maybe you walked in tonight and there are places in your life that are not making sense maybe you've lost a sense of direction maybe you don't know where you're going and where you're going to end up or where you even are right now in your life but the holy spirit listen the holy spirit is hovering over your life tonight the Holy Spirit is, is, is shaping and forming places in your life that are dark. So this is why Jesus spent so much time 
in John chapter 14, 15, and 16 talking to his disciples about the Holy Spirit. So go with me to John chapter 14. I want you to look at verse 16, John 14, verse 16. And there are three things about the Holy Spirit. I want you to catch this tonight. These are things that I teach my church on a regular basis. I teach my children this. I'm trying to live out these things that I'm going to give you tonight. And here's the first thing that the Holy Spirit, you need to know about the Holy Spirit. It's going to sound really obvious, but stay with me. Is that the Holy Spirit is near to us. The Holy Spirit is not some distant, mystical force that's out in the universe that shows up every once in a while. The, actually, the Holy Spirit is a person, and he's powerful, and he is near to us. And Jesus is reminding his disciples that on days when they feel alone, that one thing they can be certain about is that the Holy Spirit would never leave them or forsake them. Listen to this, okay? John 14. It says, I will ask the Father. This is Jesus talking. I want you to notice Father, Son, Holy Spirit. When I prayed a moment ago, and I said, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, because I want you to see the Trinitarian theology, the Trinitarian language that Jesus himself uses in this passage. He says, I will ask the Father. Jesus says, I will ask the Father, Father, Son, and he will give you another advocate and help you and be with you forever wow. Wow. stop just for a moment we all of us have been abandoned by people we just heard this beautiful testimony what a powerful testimony of this young lady that just spilled her heart out to us well listen that's that's our story in this room the reason we resonated with her story is because all of us in this room have been disappointed by people we've all been abandoned we've had people tell us that they're they would be our friends forever and then they leave we've had people that tell us they love us we love you i love you and then they are nowhere to be found when the times get tough we all have a story of being abandoned it's the great narrative of the human story as a, is of being abandoned by others and jesus says there will be days when you will feel alone you will feel disconnected but i have good news for you the holy spirit will not leave you listen to what he says next he says and he's the spirit of truth the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you and then look at this last verse verse 18 he says i will not leave you as orphans i'm not going to leave you as orphans i'm not going to abandon you the one constant the one guarantee that jesus gives us on your loneliest days on, in your darkest night on the in the day where you feel completely isolated from the human race the holy spirit is with you the holy spirit is among us listen there have been so many days where i have felt completely alone and the holy spirit comes like a whisper to me and reminds me that i am in the palm of his hand listen this is what jesus said to his disciples later on he said i have put you in the palm of my hand and nothing can take you from the palm of my hand no power of hell and no scheme of man can take you from my presence the holy spirit is near to us all right you got this all right now if that's true and it is i want you to look at the next thing that jesus says skip down to verse 25 because here's what jesus says the holy spirit is near to us and the holy spirit is our teacher the holy spirit then not only is just a friend the holy spirit is more than just someone that hangs out with us the holy spirit is now wants to take an active participation in your life the holy spirit is not just come someone to come alongside you on dark days though the holy spirit is speaking to us teaching us correcting us look at what he says here verse 25 he says all of this i've spoken while still with you remember he just said i'm not going to leave you as orphans you understand what the disciples were feeling on the day of his crucifixion he was gone the messiah was gone he was in a tomb a borrowed tomb every dream and hope that they had had for jesus to be their king jesus to be their savior in their mind they had something planned that did not work out they were alone and he knew that that's what they would feel he says there will come a day when i will, everyone will flee from you no one's going to admit that they know you how many of you have had a day when nobody would admit they knew your name come on that's a bad day right these disciples would experience this 
Nobody would know, would admit that they knew their name. Look at verse 26. He says, but I'm, I'm, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you, he will teach you all things. Every single thing. And I'll remind you of everything I have said to you. And he says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Don't be afraid. Don't be troubled. Don't be afraid when you're alone. All right, any school teachers in the room? Can we just thank God for school teachers? Any, 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 can we just thank the Lord? Okay, nobody wants to raise their hand. Okay, is there any school teachers right here? All right, do we have, here's, here's I used to teach school, okay? I taught school for four years, and then I, then I, I got, I came to my senses, right? It's the hardest job in the world. So I took an easy job. I became a pastor, right? So that, because teaching is insanely hard. But here's the, here's the thing about teaching. Teaching is uh, sharing a little bit of information and then reminding your students of it for a long time. Every day is not about teaching your students new information. And we have an entire generation of church people in America that's looking for fresh revelation every day when in fact it's the Holy Spirit's work to remind you of what Jesus has already said and done. We are, we're chasing after the new and the fancy when we should be holding on to the sacred and the holy. Yes. We should be holding on to those things that Jesus has already said. And this is exactly what Jesus said would happen. He said, listen, the Holy Spirit's going to come to you and remind you over and over again what I have already said. All right, what, what has he already said? Read the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. This is, this is the preeminent, the, the, um, the most amazing sermon ever given. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit to remind us that we should love our neighbor and forgive those who trespass against us, to bless those who curse us. It is the Holy Spirit's work to remind us of the sacred and the holy teachings of Jesus over and over and over again. Here's the Greek word, okay? This is a, a, a Greek word. I want you to write this down. You don't have to spell it right. Just pronounce it right, all right? Didasco. Say it out loud. Didasco. Okay, when Jesus said, I will teach you, he's using the Greek word here. When it's translated, it comes out didasco. Okay, this is what this means. I will teach you and remind you every single day. How many times have you been in the middle of a sentence? In the middle of a Facebook post? You're about to hit send. You're about to hit post. I don't think very many people are doing this, but a handful of you have. Okay, listen to this. In the middle of saying something, the Holy Spirit comes to you and says, don't do that. Don't do it. Love your enemy. Bless those who curse you. Bless those who vote differently than you. Bless those who came from another country and are trying to find their way. Come on, I'm not going to step on any toes here, but I'm just telling you that Jesus said something different. And this is the Holy Spirit's work to confront our broken humanity, to confront these broken areas of our life to shape us and to form us into the image of Mago Dei, the image of God, to help us become something better than we can become on our own. This is the Spirit's work every day to remind us, to shape us, and to form us. All right, here, then he changes something. All right, go to John 16. Let me show you this, okay? Most people, after they've read John 14, they caught this. All right, you catching this? The Holy Spirit is near to us. The Holy Spirit is teaching us but then he says something completely different in John 16 that most people never catch. And I want to show this to you, okay? John 16, verse 12. I want you to know something, that the Holy Spirit's not just near to you. The Holy Spirit's not just teaching us. They actually, the Holy Spirit is a guide to us. Yeah. And it's a completely different word. I'm going to show this to you, okay? John 16, verse 12. He says, I have much more to say to you. More than you could now bear. And every pastor in the room knows that's true, right? I have more to say to you. <laughs> But it's just more than you can bear, right? right? Jesus knew this, right? I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear, but when he, the spirit of truth, comes, Good. when the Holy Spirit comes near to you, when the Holy Spirit starts teaching you, then he says this, he will guide you into all truth. 
Now, most people, when they read this, they say, well, this is the same thing he just said. It's just repeating himself because he just told us in John 14 that the Holy Spirit would come near to me, that the Holy Spirit would teach me, and that's the word didasko. But when he says, I will guide you, it's a completely different Greek word. You want to hear it? Okay, you don't have to spell it. Just pronounce it. It's the hodageo. Say it out loud. Hodageo. Okay, the, the word, first word, don't get bored with me, okay? Don't get the glazed over seventh grade and algebra look here, okay? Stay with me just for a moment, okay? The first word is important. I'm going to remind you. I'm going to teach you. But then in verse 16, it's almost like he pulls the guys in. He pulls his disciples in. He says, but I have more for you than just being near to you, creating warm feelings in you. That's not what I'm about. That's important. There'll be days when just the feeling of God being near to you will save your life. That's true. There'll be days, hours every day, where I'm just coming to remind you and teach you but then there are going to be moments that I'm going to mark in your life by guiding you. And this is the word, hodageo. I have come to do more than just be near to you. I have come to be more than just your teacher and a, to be a reminder, a, you know, a push notification for your bad behavior. I'm not here just to remind you that you missed an appointment. I'm not here to remind you where a better parking spot is. I actually have something greater, more sacred, more important to do in your life. I have come to guide you. I have come to take you by the hand. So I want to tell this story. I wasn't planning on telling this story, but when I heard the young lady's testimony, I want to tell this story. Because there are some of you today that you're literally standing at a four-way intersection and you're stuck and you're frozen and you don't know what to do. And the Holy Spirit has come tonight to remind you that he's about to take you by the hand and take you on a place that you cannot go by yourself. See, here, here's what a guide does. A guide, and I'm from Colorado, so we have all these public parks and we have... We have the Arkansas River, which I don't know why it's called the Arkansas River, because it runs through Colorado and ends up in Arizona. It has nothing to do with Arkansas, okay? But it's called the Arkansas River. It's where you get all of your water, by the way. It comes from the Arkansas River into the reservoirs here, okay? It's one of the major sources of water on the entire West Coast, but we use it for rafting, okay? Well, before you drank it, we rafted on it, okay? So just remember that. All right. <laughs> So we have these, and, and this time of year in June is when all the snow is melting and these rapids are running really fast. I mean, they're dangerous. People die on these rapids. And they're, it's spectacular. If you ever get to come to Colorado, go rafting. It's an amazing experience, all right? The water's cold. It's running fast. It's crazy, crazy adrenaline rush when you do it, okay? But stop. Don't do it by yourself. You need a guide. We fish people out of that river every year that think they can do it on their own. Hire a guide. You know why you need to hire a guide? Because a guide knows what they're doing. Yes. You can't go. There are some places in your life that you think you can go by yourself. But the Holy Spirit says, do not yes. attempt to go here unless I take you by the hand and guide you yes. into this place. Fantastic. You can't do this on your own. So my wife and I, when we were a young married couple, we were living in Amarillo, Texas, and I was working in television. Anybody know where Amarillo, Texas is? Okay. All right. So Texas is so big that you remember when the maps, you actually bought a map, right? It is, it's on the second page of the map because the state can't fit on one page. You have to turn the page, and that's where Amarillo is on the other page. Okay. I didn't know that because I thought Amarillo didn't exist. All right. We're living there. Okay. And I was in television. I was working in television. And I was running from the Lord, did not want to be a pastor, but I loved God, just didn't want to be a pastor. I thought it was the worst job in, a, in the world. And I told the Lord I would charge hell with my hair on fire with a water pistol if he would not let me be a pastor. Thank God that he didn't hear me, right? So he asked me to be a pastor anyway. So I'm in television. I'm a young man. And this, uh, we had been living away from all of my family, all of my family, all of my wife's family lived in Louisiana, okay? It is number 50 on all the good list and number one on all the bad list, okay? This is the state of Louisiana where I'm from, all right? So I, but we missed our home. And I don't know how many of you have ever moved for the first time away from your family, but you get homesick. And my wife and I were super homesick. And out of the blue, uh, uh, we didn't have any children. We were living wild and free, following God, but this TV station from my hometown, a thousand miles away, called me one day and offered me the job of my dreams. More money than I'd ever made, 
more responsibility than I'd ever been given, everything that I'd ever been, I was like 29, 30 years old. It was, it was unbelievable opportunity. So on the phone, I'm in my, our little kitchen, and I'll never forget it, my wife and I are in this kitchen, and it was, it was back when they had, there was no cell phones, okay? So uh, it was back when they had rotary phones, and if you had a lot of nines in your number, nobody called you. Remember how much work it was to dial the rotary? Okay, all of you over 40 get that joke, all right? Nobody under 40, all the under 40 crowd is they're staring at me like, okay, never mind, listen. So I'm on the phone like this. There's no speaker phone, okay? That's before speaker phones. So my wife and I are listening on the phone together, and I'm writing down the job offer that the guy's given me. And my wife is going nuts because we're getting to move back to her family, my family, making more money, more opportunity than I'd ever been given. And I'm telling the guy on the phone, are you kidding me? This is amazing, I can't believe this. Oh, and I'm just trying to contain my excitement. He gets finished and I said to him, it's like four o'clock in the afternoon, I said to him, hey, um, this is an amazing offer. I'm almost certain we're going to do it, but my wife and I are Christ followers, and we're going to pray about it overnight. I'll call you in the morning. And I hung up the phone, and I high five. pow, yes! And so, so I prayed about it, yes. That's how I was going to pray about it, right? I'm not going to pray about it. I'm not going to pray about that. This is God. I was lying. I'm not praying about it. I'm saying yes to this. This is amazing. And I said to my wife, I, let's at least sleep on it, right, before we act. I didn't want to act too, too excited, right? So I said, I, gotta go, I have to go out for a walk. So I, this is a, a true story. A lot of times I don't let the facts stand in the way of a good story, but what I'm about to tell you <laughs> is an absolutely true story, okay? Now, this is exactly what happened. I, I gave my wife a high five. I said, I have to go out for a walk. I have to clear my mind. This is so exciting. I open the front door, and there's like a little steps that lead down like this. This is exactly what happened. I put my foot down the step like this, and the Lord said, no! <laughs> this is a true story. God is yelling at me, no! And I took one more step, and he went, no! No! Yes! Yes! No! <laughs> it's a true story. I'm telling you the truth. I walked right back in the house. Now, Pam is accustomed to me going on four-minute walks. You don't get a body like this walking 40 minutes, right? <laughs> right? It's short walks are, are fine. So that's not what surprised Pam. She goes, what are you doing back? I said to my wife, I said, Pam, we can't go. She goes, what? I mean, she's, she's the sweetest sweetest wife she's so sweet and now god is yelling me uh, at me on the front porch and my wife is yelling this is a true story she goes what i said pam we can't go i i i'm i don't know why we can't take this job now she looked at me she said okay but we're still going to sleep on it <laughs> and we're going to sleep in different rooms <laughs> that's a true story <laughs> so <laughs> it's too much information all right so the next morning we both woke up and the lord had spoken to us don't don't you can't take this and we're we just turned down an opportunity to go back to our hometown to be near our family and and we didn't know why now we don't have any kids at this point in our life and we couldn't have kids we, the doctor's telling us you can't have kids and, we, and that was another reason why we wanted to go home. We were lonely, and we were barren, and we couldn't have children. And the Lord said, no. And this is the moment, John 16. He said, Brady, I'm going to guide you into a place that you can't go by yourself. But you're going to have to trust to me. It's not about me just being near to you. It's not about me reminding you of the Sunday school lessons you learned when you were a kid. No, this is a, a pivotal moment. This is a moment where if you don't let me take you by the hand, you're going to miss out on an experience that you'll never have on your own. This is what hodageo means. I'm going to take you by the hand, and I'm going to lead you into a place that you cannot and should not go on your own. Are you catching this? Yeah. We hung, I called that guy the next day and said, I am so sorry. I can't come, I can't take it. I can't do this. He goes, what? Do you need more money? I was like, yes, I need more money, but I can't take it. 
I can't, I, I said, it, it doesn't matter what you offer me, I can't not take this job. It was the hardest, one of the hardest phone calls I've ever made in my life. I had to call my mom and dad. She had to call her mom and dad and tell, we're not coming home. And we hung up the phone, and here's what happened. God went silent for 90 days. Now, I know you want to think, well, the next day, got a big check in the mail, something happened, right? No. <laughs> I don't have that story. For 90 days, God went agonizingly silent. And we doubted everything we had heard. And it was a test of whether or not we would trust the Lord with all of our heart and lead not into our own understanding and all our ways acknowledge him and he would lead our paths. It was this moment, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Let me say it one more time. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. And for 90 days, we just quoted that to each other. I would yell it to her in the other bedroom. Hey, look, Matt, <laughs> it wasn't that bad, but we were mad. We were mad at each other. We're mad at God. We're mad at everything. And so one day at work, about oh, four, like 4, 4.30, 5 o'clock, late in the day, end of the work day, I get this phone call from an elderly pastor at the church where we were attending. His name was John Love. Is that the best name for a pastor? <laughs> John the Beloved, you catch that? John Love. His name was John Love. The best pastor name of all time. John Love. He calls me. He goes, Brady, um, what are you doing? And I said, I'm working at a job I don't want to like. I don't even like this job anymore. <laughs> I want to be back in Louisiana. He said, well... I had this mom sitting in my office, and she's six months pregnant, and she was, uh, this is in Texas, so you'll catch us in just a moment. She was mowing her yard. On, she's six months pregnant, three little kids. It's her fourth child, uh, and the Lord spoke to her three months ago that she was supposed to give you that baby. And she's been wrestling with it all this time. But why was God silent? Because there was a wrestling going on in the spiritual realm, and you don't know what's happening. And you keep blaming God for his silence when God is really busy at work on your behalf. Yeah. And he's busy at work. Wow. All right, he said to me, he said, Brady, I know y'all have been praying for kids. She wants to give you this baby. Will you pray about it? And I said, I'll pray about it. Yes, we'll take it. I mean, just like that, honestly. <laughs> I will pray about that, yes. And three months later, we brought Abram home to, with us, and he's now 19 years old. He's half Italian. He's a junior in college. His birth father is a nuclear physicist, so it's obvious he's not my biological son. He's really, I mean, he's really smart, okay, and really good looking and thin. So he's not my son. We know that, right? He's not my biological son. But he is such a joy. To, we brought him home from the hospital, and Two years later, a 19-year-old mom who was pregnant with a kid she couldn't raise called us, and we adopted a little girl with red curly hair and blue eyes. Both of them are adopted, and they both happened in Amarillo, Texas, because we let the Lord take us by the hand and take us and guide us. And so I want to read something to you. This is, this is from a guy... Uh, named Sir Francis Drake. You can Google his name. He's a 16th century pirate. He's a thug, okay? He, he was, for most of his life, he was a pirate. He was a slave trader. He was a punk, a thug. But late in his life, something happened in him. He had this crazy God experience late in his life and started writing these beautiful prayers and poems to God that, were, that are still being read today. I'm about to read it to you. And I don't know where he wrote this, but it's, it is definitely him. But late in his life, something happened remarkable in his life. And I'm going to read this poem to you, okay, that he wrote in late in his life before he died. This prayer is actually on the wall of my office. I read it every single day to remind me of John 16. I want to read this to you, okay? You ready for this? 
And this is just part of it. You can Google it and get the rest of the poem. I'm just going to read one small portion of his prayer uh, to you. It says, disturb us, Lord. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you asked God to disturb you? I have found that the Holy Spirit is indeed the great comforter. He is, there's nobody that comforts me like the Holy Spirit. And there is no one who disturbs me more than the Holy Spirit. Disturb us, O Lord. To dare more boldly, to venture on wider seas, where storms will show your mastery, where losing sight of land, we shall find the stars. This is the Holy Spirit's work. Some of you are playing it way too safe. Because you want the Holy Spirit to be your boyfriend or girlfriend you want the holy spirit to come and make you feel comfortable you want the holy spirit to remind you of sunday school lessons but the holy spirit is actually wanting to take you on an adventure that's probably going to be mysterious and risky and a bit dangerous at times the holy spirit wants to lit- listen you know who jesus is talking to in john 16 these men would give their lives for the gospel they would take the good news of the gospel all over the world, and they would die a bloody death, a martyr's death because of it. They had to hear Jesus say this, Hodegeo, I am going to take you by the hand, I'm going to guide you to a place that's going to feel risky and dangerous, and I'm going to lead you there, and it's going to be me doing it. You do, we cannot play safe. This is not a time to play safe. The kingdom of heaven is advancing, and the violent are advancing it by force. Listen, it is the people of God right now that he needs us to quit playing it safe. Listen, I'm 51 years old. I know that's shocking to you. I know that's shocking, but I'm 51. I know you thought I was 61, but I'm actually only 51, right? And all all my 50-plus friends in this room, the Lord needs us to quit playing it so safe as we get older. And it's easy to tell 20-somethings to go be risky and dangerous, because quite honestly, there's not a lot to lose in your 20s. You may lose it all and lose 300 bucks. I'm talking about people in their 50s. (laughs) I'm, t- I'm serious. I'm talking about people that have worked, we've worked our entire lives to get ready for retirement. This is, there's no retirement in the Bible. There may be a readjustment, a repositioning, a reassignment, but the Lord is asking us to be risky again. <laughs> Disturb us, O oh Lord. So it, when I turned 50 years old a year and a half ago, I remember on my, the morning of my birthday, the Lord said that to me. Brady, you're 50. You can kind of cruise in now. Play it safe. Too much to lose. Don't say things that are going to rattle people. Don't challenge people the way... Don't do that. Don't question their politics. Don't question their loyalties. Just preach good stuff and make people happy. And then I read this point. I read this prayer in my office. Disturb us, O Lord. To dare more boldly. And I'm laying there in bed early on my 50th birthday. It's like early, like 6 a.m. early. There is an a.m. there, by the way. There's a 6 a.m. And I'm laying there wide awake on my birthday. And I started praying that three-word prayer that I told you at the first of the sermon. Come, Holy Spirit. Just like this. I just put my hands like this, and I said, come, Holy Spirit. And I've been teaching my church to pray this now for a year and a half. And I'm not here to wrestle with you about theology. I know the Holy Spirit's already here with us. I, I'm not, I, know, I know that, okay? Listen to me very carefully. It is, it is possible to spend your entire life with an expert and never ask for their advice. It is possible that you're living very close to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is indeed your friend. The Holy Spirit is indeed your teacher. But when was the last time you'd really humbled yourself and ask for the Holy Spirit to lead you, to take control of you, to disturb you, to help you to dare more boldly. Yes, the Holy Spirit is there with you, but he has to be asked for his advice. He has to be asked to be Lord of your life. And so tonight I'm going to lead you in a three-word prayer that could very well change your life. It could change the direction of your life. It could change the way you follow Jesus. And it's a three-word prayer that I prayed this morning really early before I got on a plane and came here. 
wide awake this morning at 5.30 in the morning, mountain time, I sat before the Lord, and I, before I turned my phone on, before I turned on any television, before my eyes were really wide awake, I said, come, Holy Spirit, knowing that I would be here with you tonight, and we would need the Holy Spirit to be present with us. So tonight, would you just turn your hands like this, and I'm going to dismiss in four seconds, but I want to pray this three-word prayer over you. Come, Holy Spirit. We know that you're here with us. You are near to us. You are our teacher. And you are our guide. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. God bless you guys. Love you.